Okay. Well, we have um, our final installment here in the sales process flowchart for selling. If you're in the construction trades, if you're selling homeowners, if you're selling commercial jobs, if you're in construction and you find yourself in a position where you're selling and you want to make your sales better, you want to get more clients, you want to get better clients, you have to follow a system. This whole series, series is sponsor, sponsored by a company called HES. They do solar solutions. Let me take these things out of my ear. What am I doing with these in right now? Um, HES is a solar panel distribution company. They do everything for solar. And they recognize the importance of training their dealers on these kinds of important issues. And really, they recognize that even though this is called Profit Tool Belt, and it's for all trades. It doesn't matter if you paint houses. It doesn't matter if you make cabinets. Doesn't matter if you do uh, concrete forms and framing or roofing or tiles or, elect or you're an electrician, mechanical contractor, etc. We all follow the same process because this podcast, this show is about the business of business. It's very different. When you're listening to this show, you're listening because you're already good at your trade. People are already coming to you and working with you because you're good, because they get referred to you. But you want to grow and you're seeing yourself more as a business person who wants to grow. And so you're now thinking from the neck up. And that's why you'd listen to this show. Don't listen to me if you want to be better at your trade. I can't show you how to swing a hammer better or be squarer or plumber or more leveler than you already are in the job. Okay. But now we're talking about the sales process. There's seven steps to the sales process. We are now on set number seven, number eight in the series, because I did a little overview in the first episode. Go back and watch all those. Listen, before I get into the, the content today, which is how to follow up, I call it getting stuck in follow up a which is a cold and lonely place when you, uh, all you hear back from the people across the kitchen table is, we'll talk to you later. Give us a call in two weeks. Well, that's all BS. What it means to me when that happens is I made a mistake. I made a mistake in this deal. I've got to figure out how to change that in the next deal so I can go back and make sure it doesn't happen to me again, right? That's what this is all about. It's about constant learning and never ending improvement, just like lean process, right? Constant and never ending improvement. Here's the seven steps to the selling process, just so you have them as an overview, okay? <clears throat> Step number one is prospecting. That's finding new, potentially qualified people who could potentially work with you, afford what you are selling, and be able to do work with you in a reasonable time. So not in two years, not in three years, but pretty quickly. So Because you need to get new business and you need to find people who need that work done. So that's the prospecting stage. After that, Step number two is the qualifying stage. Now, the qualifying stage is very important because I'm asking great questions and I'm listening very carefully to make sure that we have all of the things in place that we need in order for myself and the, the person who I'm selling to, to be able to do a deal for me to help them buy. So we've got prospecting, stage one, qualifying, stage two, and then stage number three is appointment setting. Now, appointment setting is a stage on its own because you have to do it right in order to make sure you have the right people sitting at the table making the big decisions about the job that needs to be done. If you don't set the appointments right, you're probably getting stuck at that stage now and you are frustrated as H-E double hockey sticks. You're just getting stuck. So you got to go back and fix that stage. If you want to go look at that, that's uh, episode number three in this series on this channel. After that, we're in the presenting stage. That's presenting is stage number four. Lesser salespeople, rookies, people that are stuck all the time, think that's stage number one. It's stage number four. And if you think it's stage number one right now, that's why you're getting stuck. Okay, you need to go back and listen to all of this stuff. It's not going to take you long. It's free. What's holding you back? This is your business. I can't hold your hand and make you learn something. You've got to go get the knowledge. You've got to make the changes. I'm giving you everything here for free. Please go listen. You'll get what you need there and you'll figure out how to get unstuck at the presenting stage. Presenting is sometimes called the sales presentation. If you think you just swoop in and do the sales presentation because you're such a hot shot, you, my friend, are not a hot shot and you're wrong. Go back, restudy, and start again. That's all you got to do is keep getting better. That's stage number four. Then we move into closing, which is step number five or stage number five. Closing is actually a non-event. If you do it right, closing is just a piece of the conversation. Hey, when do we get started? Where do you want us to leave the materials and equipment the day before we start? Really details. <clears throat> but you've done everything right up till then to get to the deal at that point. If you find it very stressful, internally stressful, and you hate asking the closing question, 
it's because you're not doing things properly. You're not following the system, the process, steps one, two, three, four, and five, which is closing. Okay, so go back and look at that too. Then we get to objection handling. So after I've asked the closing question, hey, should we do business together? When can we get started? Where do you want the fridge to go? What color will the backsplash be? That's, those are all closing questions, by the way. Um, then we deal with objection handling. You will learn, and you'll know this if you saw the other episodes, we like objections. We actually want to have people asking us questions because that means they're interested. But in a previous video, I also showed you how to deal with those objections in a very smart and systematic way because you need a process. Look, if you want to grow your business, if you want to make this into everything you dreamed of it being, it's not hard, but it's not easy either. It means you've got to learn some new things. You've got to follow a system, a process to get you there. And I want to show you that process as we're doing here right now. So go back and watch. They're all free videos. Can't do any more for you. Okay, so objection handling is in there. And now today, here we are in follow-up. So that's step number seven in the seven-step sales process. This is how you close more deals with the right kind of clients. Now, we talked about the right kind of clients before. Let me scroll down in my notes right here, make sure I'm following the stages as well. Um, the goal for this stage, the follow-up stage, is that we get the deal. The deal is already gone. At this point, you've probably already lost it. If you didn't get the deal when you asked for it, there's a good chance you're never going to get that deal. It's called your conversion rate. Conversion rate is the word we use in professional sales and sales management and being an entrepreneur business owner. Your conversion rate drops dramatically if you don't get the deal on that spot. But are you going to just let it go? No, you've you got to take your best shot. So I'm going to show you ways to still keep that deal alive until you know it's dead until you know it's absolutely gone. You've put in a lot of time, a lot of work, and a lot of money getting here. I don't want to see you waste it. It's already gone. Once you're in follow-up stage, your chances of getting, if you usually close 10% of the deals you're in front of, you're now down, your chances of getting this are 2%. Let me stop for a second. I just said, if you close 10% of the deals you're in front of, some of you went, well, obviously this Rubino guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Because I close almost everybody that I sit in front of. And if you've said that, I'm calling BS on you, my friend. Because that means one of two things. Number one, you're leaving a ton of money on the table. Other people know it, and that's why you're selling to all of them. And number two, you're not sitting in front of enough people. I've been at this game for a very long time. I've heard that argument, that discussion, that line of logic and reasoning from thousands of people. And it always comes down to the same thing. By the way... Some of those people used to be me. I'm either selling it too cheap or I'm not working hard enough and seeing enough people. I don't want a high conversion rate. You know who has a high conversion rate? People that are doing illegal things. The oldest profession in the world? Pretty much 100% conversion rate, I would think. People selling drugs? It's 100% conversion rate. Everybody that comes to see them, unless it's an undercover cop, buys from them. Oldest profession in the world? If somebody knocks on their door, pretty much guaranteed that sale's gonna happen, right? You and I, selling professional trade contracting services, we should not have a 100% conversion rate. If you do, you have a problem. It seems like it shouldn't be a problem, but it is. You're leaving money on the table or you're not seeing enough people. So that's why I say if you've got a 10% conversion rate, normally, by the time you get to the follow-up stage, by the time you're sent to follow up a stand, your conversion rate's gonna plummet to about 2%. It's really, 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 really low and it's a tough, a cold and lonely place to be. So let's talk about fixing it. So once you know you're in the follow-up stage, um, the closing, you've tried to get the deal, you've asked them when we can get started, they've come back with some sort of condition like, oh, we can't get started, or my wife wasn't here, she really needs to be here for this deal to go forward. All those are indications you made a mistake earlier. You needed to make sure the wife was there at that decision-making point, right? So go fix that. That, by the way, happens in step number two, three and five. All of those stages it needed to be there already. So go back and fix your process. Follow the system. But you ask the closing question and they say no for some reason. Okay, what you need to do here now is you need to grow a pair. You need to grow a set. You've got to ask about six more times. Nicely, politely, professionally. Sit down, hold onto the table, stay there, do not leave. Keep the conversation going, keep the conversation professional, 
keep it proactive, keep it future focused, like looking to the future when we're going to do this job, have a very nice conversation. Just because they said no, I want you to translate in that, that in your mind to not right yet. Well, I'm going to do this, but not right yet. So no just means not just yet, okay? But I want you to go through at least what we call three full closing cycles. So you have three times you loop back around to uh, they say no, have a conversation, have a conversation, have a conversation, talk about budget, need, timing, relationship, and then suggest that we work together again, then do it one more time. And every time they say no, go back one more time. Do that three full times. Once you're there, you're pretty clear that you have been um, banished to follow up a stand, a cold and a lonely place. So what do we do when we are truly in follow up a stand? Couple of things. Let me look at my notes to make sure I'm hitting, hitting you right between the eyes on this. The goal of this step is to save a lost deal. So I gotta make sure it's lost first. So ask yourself, did I do everything I could to make sure I even asked for the deal? Did I have my paperwork in hand? Did I have a pen ready? Did I have the contract on my iPad, however you're gonna do it? Did I ask multiple times for the deal? The next thing we wanna do is make sure that we have our trust tips in place. Does this person trust me? Because a lot of the times, and especially now in this current state of the world that we're in, trust is a massive factor for people making a buying decision. And I know, and you know, that you're the best contractor in the world, the perfect person to help them. You have the skills, the knowledge, the equipment, the tools, and the integrity to be able to help these people. So let's do that. But we also have to prove to them. They have to know that they can trust us. You may have heard this saying before, people like to do business with other people that they know, like, and trust. So have you been likable? Have you been trustworthy? And do they know you? If you're holding back on any of those things, your chances of getting the deal again are dropping. So make sure those things are open for you. Make sure you're available to, to do work with this person and that you're having a real and genuine conversation with them. Okay. So now we're going into the follow-up stage. Trust tips that you want to put in place are making sure that you can make promises that you can easily keep. Okay. So when we go into follow-up, watch me now, we're going to make some promises that we can easily keep. And the reason for that is I want to show them that I'm trustworthy and that I'm following up and that I'm a professional and I can be trusted to do what I say I'm going to do. They are just doing what's best for them. You've got to do what's best for you and you have to help them out. You really are the best solution for them to fix their uh, basement mold remediation, asbestos removal, uh, roofing, solar question, painting, whatever it is. You got to help them, okay? So what we have is we need to use our scripts. So you say, okay, here's what we're going to do. You've said no. You said you want to wait. You want to make the decision next week, next year, next month. No matter what their answer is, the very first thing is, in your mind, cut it in half. So if they say, hey, Dom, let's talk again in two weeks and we'll give you our answer then. Great. In your book and in your phone, I want you to go back and cut that in half. No matter what time frame they gave you, cut it in half. If they said, let's talk next week, cut it down to three days. If they said, let's talk in two weeks, you cut it down to one week. Now you might be thinking, why? And Dom, that sounds very impolite. They said two weeks. And so I'm going to follow up in two weeks. <clears throat> My friend, you're already going to lose this deal. There's number one. You are losing this deal as it stands right now. All your time, money, money energy, 100% wasted. But also, they don't know what they're talking about. Two weeks, two days, two years, three months, whatever. You know, I remember one of the best ones I ever heard, just so you know, I was early in my sales career. So this must've been in the mid eighties. And uh, I was selling real estate. I was a real estate agent selling homes. And I was doing lots of phone calls, calling people to see if they wanted to list their home. This is so long ago. And uh, at the end of the day, I was talking to my sales manager. And I said, I got a great lead today. And my sales manager, happy for me because he'd seen me working really hard. He said, what do you mean you got a great lead? I said, I got somebody who said, as soon as the OJ trial is over, they're going to list their house with me. And I was so bought into the BS answer that I believed it. And my manager repeated their answer back to me. He was a very wise, good guy. And he said, so you're telling me that they're basing the sale of their house on when the OJ trial ends. That's when they're going to talk to you. It just, I mean, it sounds ludicrous, right? It was a BS answer. And you, my friend, are being fed BS answers right now. 
If they say, call me in a week, cut it in half. Call them in three days. Now, what do we say when we talk to them in three days? Hey, George. Hey, Susan. It's Dominic calling. I'm calling to set our time to talk at the end of this week. Right? Just keep that communication going, but I want you to cut it in half. If they say call us tomorrow, then that's pretty tight, but I want you to send them a text that night and in the morning saying, I'm going to talk to you this afternoon. Cut it in half. Always, always, always cut it in half because you, my friend, are in follow up a and it is a cold and lonely place where there are no deals to be had. 2% chance, maybe, of getting that deal. You got to work hard and you got to work smart. Con la cabeza. With your head, you got to work smart. Okay, um, you also need to have confidence through this stage. Always show confidence. They've said no, but it's not no to you. Don't take it personally, okay? Go watch Tommy Boy. And if you've ever watched the movie, Tommy Boy is the greatest. When uh, Chris Farley gets told no and he's like, puts his hands on the chair, he's like, okie dokie, and he just walks out. But he's emotionally crushed. I, I get it. It's hard to hear no, but just take the no. Just take the no and move on. Always have that confidence and calmness. <clears throat> um, now we're going to talk about making easy promises. So we're talking to George and Susan. This happens to be a residential deal. Again, it doesn't matter what your trade is. Uh, George and Susan say, well, we want to wait a couple days. Okay, great. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you uh, an email as soon as this meeting's over. And that email has this very important document in it. You know, how to choose the best uh, hot water tank for your home. Uh, how solar heating works to heat your pool. Uh, things people consider when using solar to heat their cottage, cabin, or second home. Whatever your cool document is in your industry, you're going to make that promise to them. That's the first thing. Then I'm going to put an appointment in our calendar to talk on the day that we just agreed on. So they're going to say, let's talk in a week. I'm going to tell them, okay, what I'll do is I'll call you in three days. What time should I call you at? And on that call, we'll reset our meeting for the end of the week. So I'm making appointments. I'm promising to do things. I'm keeping the momentum going. I'm showing that I'm professional. I'm calm. I'm cool. I'm collected. I am the best solution. There's a good chance they are crapping their pants right now because they didn't realize the price was going to be to what it was or one of the terms that you talked about freaked them out or they don't trust you. You showed them something that freaked them out. They want to talk to somebody else because they don't think your crew is going to wear masks or gloves or something that's very, very important to them. And that means you didn't qualify them properly and you didn't ask enough questions and you didn't do your objection handling. All of these are prior stages. These are earlier stages in the sales process. And by the way, I get caught in this all the time too. I know when I'm going to follow up a stand, that cold and lonely place because I've done something wrong earlier or they've tried to push something past me. The, the best one is, no, 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 I make all the decisions. My wife, I'll tell my wife what we're going to do. We're just going to do it. And then it comes down to put pen to paper and the guy says, well, Dom, I mean, really, you've laid out some very important things here. I'm going to need to talk to my wife. And in my head, I'm like, you just told me you made all the decisions. And my fault was believing his BS. He doesn't make all the decisions. I'm married. I should know better. But there we are. Okay. Um, the other thing here, there's a lot to follow up right? There's still a lot of work. Sales is not necessarily easy, but it follows a systematic process. I like to think of it more like chess than checkers. So if you follow the systematic process, you'll get your way through. Really thinking and acting strategically will get you deals and the best deals. And remember, all of the training that we do here at Profit Tool Belt is aimed at getting the affluent customer, the wealthy customer, the best customer. And so you need to have the best tools in order to get the best clients. So there's something we talk about called the windshield wiper technique. And I just actually shared it with you. Uh, I'm going to give them a fact and then something else is going to happen. I'm going to give them a fact and then we're going to follow up. I'm going to give them a fact and we're going to follow up. It's always that, right? So when I leave the meeting, I'm going to send you an article and then I'll follow up to talk about the article. And then I'll set an appointment with you and I'll call to confirm that you got the appointment. And then we'll set the appointment. And then on the appointment, we're going to make another promise that I can keep. So it goes back and forth and back and forth. That windshield wiper technique comes from a gentleman named Brian Tracy. Brian is an absolute master at sales and sales improvement, sales management throughout the world. Many of you have read his stuff or seen him live on stage and you'll recognize that technique. You know, my friends, you've got more training now on how to follow up after a deal than most people will ever, ever have in their professional sales training career. The key is now you've got to take something and do with it. 
If you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to keep getting the same results you have right now. So you need to go back and change things. The most important thing in selling is to be brutally honest with yourself. So hard because the world is already brutally honest with you when all you hear is no, 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 no. Now you've got to have the internal strength to say to yourself, where did I mess up that deal? How did I get sent to follow up a stem? You got sent there because you did something wrong beforehand. You didn't prospect right. You didn't qualify right. You didn't set the appointment right. You didn't do the sales meeting right. You didn't do the objection handling, the closing, all of those things. Somewhere I have to take responsibility myself and understand that I messed up somewhere earlier and it's showing up now. All right, folks. Thanks so much for checking in. I also want to thank HES for um, sponsoring this. If you have questions, leave them in the comments below. What did you like best about what I just talked about here, about following up and being relegated to follow up a stand? I'd love to hear what you have to say. Leave it in the comments below. Thanks so much, folks. We'll check in with you soon.